and all these famous guitarists walking the street, hanging out. You got David Bowie, you got like Elton John's working in one of the offices. You know, you got David Bowie sleeping in his van in the alley. Jimmy <laughs> Page walking down the street. It's like a crazy environment. Welcome to the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate, and we have got Josh Scott with us today from JHS Pedals. Josh is the founder. He's the host of the JHS show, and we're talking about electric guitar effects and pedals and how this innovation has really shaped music and culture along with the artists, of course, but but the pedals and the gear is, is relatively unappreciated, at least by the common music lover. And so this was a really fun conversation for me. It helped shed some light on parts of this uh, of this world that weren't clear to me before. Josh is a great guy. He knows a lot about all of this. And I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, there's plenty more where this came from on their YouTube channel. And we will link to that, of course, in the description. Without any further ado, Josh Scott. My first question for you, and to help with, I, I know that not every member of our audience is a guitar person even the way I am, which is just kind of casually and as a hobby. So can you kind of walk the listeners through uh, guitar pedals, what they are, and how if they've listened to really any music over the last 50 years, they probably are a fan of them. They just may not realize it. But can you give give the lay person the, the lay of the land here? Yeah, it's guitar pedals. So guitar is electrified in 1931. And uh, it's misunderstood and weird, and it kind of evolved. So you get into the 40s, and some effects start taking place. And and an effect is you put a circuit, you put the guitar, the electrified guitar, through a circuit that manipulates or affects the sound. Um, So some of the very first instances, instances of this would have been the 1947 D. Armin 601 tremolo. It's a little box. You like set it on the amp, and it made made the sound kind of vibrate on and off. Then you have reverb. When we think of you know, you go into a cave and yell. You kind of had a reverb tank that came out. Leo Fender uh, borrowed that from Hammond organs, church organs, and put that out in 1961. So you have these effects that that are taking place. One of the biggest effects was the very early electric guitar evolution was here's an electric guitar now. It's pretty new. Plug it into an amp. An amp is really just a tube radio. That's the circuit. It's the same thing that people sat around and listened to, you know, mystery shows and all that (laughs) stuff. Uh, But instead of receiving radio signal and amplifying it into your living room for your family, you plugged your guitar in and amplified it. Um, And one of the things that happened early on, you see this late forties, you see the very primitive early origins of rock and roll is people kept turning these up too loud. And what happens when you turn them up too loud is they don't stay clean and pretty. They get kind of gnarly and that's rock and roll. That's the sound of distortion and overdrive. And then the first guitar pedal. So a guitar pedal being a device you click a switch with your foot was 1962. It was invented uh, by a studio engineer and his friend, uh, Glenn Snoddy and Revis Hobbs. And they invented the first pedal ever. It's a fuzz pedal. And it was because they recorded a Marty Robbins song called Don't Worry. And um, a mixer desk broke. And it like broke the sound of the guitar. So instead of do, 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 it was more like (laughs) just a crazy sound. They recreate that track. Um, And three years later, Keith Richards used it on I Can't Get No Satisfaction, the main riff, the the dun, 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 dun. Uh And from that point on, guitar pedals like rule the world secretly. A lot of people don't realize what they're seeing or hearing. You go to a concert or you watch award shows on TV. There's always a thing at a guitar player's feet. There's something down there and they're touching it 
and it's affecting the sound of the guitar. So it's these small kind of unseen boxes and they literally change sound and have changed music for a lot of years. I mean, yeah, we're looking at 60 years of the pedal. So that's a lot of so much music and so much influence culturally and everything. So yeah, these little guitar pedals, um, they affect the sound. I hope that was an okay explanation. No, Not it's too amazing. much for you. Okay. No, it's it's amazing. It's it's probably the thing. You, the the more history you learn, the more I'm sure you're still learning little stories and anecdotes that just kind of put a smile on your face. But mm -hmm. um, I got to think it's been. I, well, I guess to this day, it's a sort of a progression. People are still kind of uncovering and maybe discovering. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the I, ways no, I, that this sounds can be modified, so it, it continues to kind of like develop. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, my role, I've had JHS Pedals, a pedal company that I accidentally started 14 years ago. So you know, 45 ish employees now. But I also do this historian work, um, musicology slash guitar historian stuff. I mean, I just interviewed a guy in Nashville three days ago. His dad was Revis Hobbs, the inventor. I like I'm going around learning more and more about the intricacies and the nuance of how the things happened when they happened. It's amazing. I'm constantly learning. I'll never figure it all out. In this room, there's somewhere between three and four thousand pedals and all <laughs> of them have a story. And that's my favorite part. Yeah. Did that did Revis come up with the word fuzz to describe that tone did he is he the one who kind of even coined that most perfect descriptive name that that is an interesting question that i have been searching for the answer to um who first said fuzz i i'm trying to trace that back is like it's like archaeologists finding you know a clay pot from like you know, a billion <laughs> years ago and trying to be like, <laughs> who made did they it? <laughs> eat cereal or soup out of this pot? It's like, I can't quite figure it out. The, yeah. fu the fuzz, the fuzz term, I think it, I think it would date back to, it's when people started turning up their amps or breaking their amps. There's all these stories, uh, people taking needles and stabbing the speaker cones. And oh, wow. uh, one of, there's a song called Rocket 88. A lot of historians, musicologists believe it's the first rock and roll song, Rocket 88, mm -hmm. and the guitar is all fuzzy. And, you know, this is Ike Turner's band. They're leaving Clarksdale, Mississippi, driving up Highway 61 to Memphis to Sam Phillips, who would later open Sun and record Elvis. But at this wow. point, he's he's figuring it all out. But they have a flat tire, pull the amp out, apparently drop the amp, which is a tube radio, sort uh -huh. of. They get to the studio and it's broken. Sam Phillips shoves paper into it to fix the speaker cone and it sounds fuzzy. Oh my uh, it's, gosh. it's just a determination of, did we describe it fuzzy later or was it fuzzy yeah. back then? And it's, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> it never clicked for me until you just explained it, but this is why rock and roll is associated with being loud. Not because, I mean, it was loud, but mm -hmm. they were trying to get their amps to break up in that way. Oh, yeah. And that was probably much louder than the other music at the time for that reason alone, not because they were just trying to like raise hell. Yeah. Rock and roll evolved. It was a chicken and the egg scenario. And the, the scenario is you got these 19 late forties. So say go listen to Bob Wills and the Texas playboy record and imagine them live. You know, they pull up in a bus. There's like 30 members or something ridiculous, horns, drums, yeah. <laughs> that guitar player's got to be heard over that stuff. Yeah. So it keeps turning up, turning up. It goes from that to, you know, Brit, like London, 1962, 63, 64. Jim Marshall starts making these amps. He's a drummer, doesn't want to import the Fender stuff because the taxes are high. So they make their own and they keep having people like Pete Townsend come in and go, I need it louder because the drummer's <laughs> too loud. And then so... Rock and roll is this evolution of louder, 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 louder. And yeah. as you turn a tube amp up, you know, a 10 watt tube amp, which is small, it's going to distort really quickly when you turn up, but it won't be as loud. It'll have uh, yeah. kind of a lower threshold, but you get these hun like Hendrix. If you look at Jimi Hendrix on stage, 
I cannot fathom the volume, like yeah. the wall of amps. He, he referred to his amps as these refrigerator size things in an interview. And he has them all the way up, like on 900 watt Marshall plexis. Oh my um, God. Like I've stood in front of, you know, some famous guitar players rigs at sound checks and my ears are deaf, but they're not, they're nothing like what you see in these 1960s shows. Cause they didn't have PAs. They didn't have sound systems. So a lot of these bands, they're like literally having to push the volume from the stage to a complete audience from the end. Oh. Cause sound systems didn't exist till the grateful dead. They invented the sound system as we know it. Yeah. So it's like, there's this, yeah, what you're saying is true. Rock and roll wow. is all about loudness breaking everything. The tone of the guitar. The ev- yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's really amazing. So you mentioned Hendrix, and I'm sure he's a part of all of this conversation. But can you can you talk about some other artists who were using pedals and kind of? I got to think the artists themselves were sort of discovering what they could do. Mm-hmm. separate from the engineer building them so who who yeah. are some of the big you know um uh, I, don't, I don't know like waypoints along that along yeah. that sort of path yeah that's a that's a great question you know the first is going to be keith richards satisfaction is the maestro fz1 maestro uh-huh. buzz tone so in a way he was the first guitar pedal hero i guess you could say hey, there was and a, that song was, was the song was massive too so oh, yeah. it was like the mainstream song, instantly the song was huge so that's 1965 and so pedals start all around the london scene you have a street called uh denmark street tin pan alley and that is a street in london in this time where you walk down the street it's still there but like you know there's like cell phone stores on it now and a few struggling guitar shops. But in the day, <laughs> all guitar and all these famous guitarists walk in the street, hanging out. You got David Bowie, you got like Elton John's working in one of the offices. You know, you got David Bowie sleeping in his van in the alley, Jimmy <laughs> Page walking down the street. It's like a crazy environment. Yeah. They, they, they start creating that use of pedals in music. So one of the most famous stories is that maestro that Keith Richards used the first pedal ever. It's taken to a shop called Macari's music. And the guy who wrote the James Bond theme song, the da, 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 that guy, yeah. uh, Dick something, he walks into Macari's and goes, can you make this sound bigger? And they modify it and it becomes the tone bender. And a guy named Gary Hurst mods that pedal, makes a new one, the Sola Sound Tone Bender. And that pedal, this is 1965. So that pedal comes from America into England, modified, turned into the Tone Bender. Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Eric Clapton. It's just uh. on and on and on. Mark Ronson, all these dudes. And it comes back to us in the form of the British invasion. So there's a really cool <laughs> narrative of how just like they took our Clarksdale blues Delta blues music and turned it into blues rock. They mm-hmm. took our electronics, turned them into something and dumped them back on us. So these very right. first people are, it's literally the origins of everything we love. I mean, it's Eric Clapton as a young man in the blues breakers and then cream. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix arrives in uh, September, 1966, I think. Don't quote me on that. Definitely 66. He arrives in summer or fall of 66. The Dallas Arbiter, the Arbiter, Fuzzface, is released at the exact time. That's the pedal he used his whole life. So, and then that same year, Wah Pedal's invented. Who uses it first? Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton. So as things were being invented, certain people were like literally using it in the moment and creating. And I like to think about, you know, how do you become a guitar god? you sound different than everyone else. Now, Hendrix is amazing. Clapton's amazing. But add the brand new fuzz face or the brand new wah yeah. For Hendrix, the brand new Univibe, the brand new octave fuzz, no one had them. Yeah. And yeah. so there's anyone in the 60s was a prominent user of affecting the guitar. And we see it's almost like a violently fast progression. Because 62... When I teach this, it's like 62 is like Andy Griffith's show. 
<laughs> right? It's like, uh, leave it to Beaver. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? And 69 is like naked people on acid rolling around in the mud. So you have like seven years. When yeah. has there ever been a seven year period yeah. so crazy? Vietnam yeah. War, free, like, and the sound of the guitar was the mode i mean i think it was the one of the biggest motivational factors in yeah. how culture changed yeah. like the accordion wasn't causing art yeah the accordion wasn't causing like that was the big instrument in 60 59 60 55 the accordion's not out protesting the vietnam war on the stage <laughs> at woodstock like can you imagine yeah there's just something it's like yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that that movement would have gone nowhere <laughs> yeah Man, so, really amazing it's funny how i think of the 60s and all of these you know legendary artists as as a, a type of nostalgia not that i not like i was there but it's it's previous generations and it's old time and but the way you describe it it's for them it was cutting edge the newest technology oh. and innovation it's almost the opposite because we ha we continue to have new technology and innovation in this space, but but most people would it seems would rather be looking at the old gear and the old stuff because that's what they had. Isn't that kind of a, a strange like contradiction? It is. I mean, the pedals in that day were you know that's the tone bender was Steve Jobs revealing the iPod. You know, yeah, <laughs> it was like that big. Yeah, and yeah, what you're saying is. I still, but I do this. I still go over to my guitar rack and pick up basically a 52 Telecaster or like, like the other, you know, my jazz master. It's all stuff mm -hmm. from the sixties. It's all like, it's weird how there's such a connection to that. And in a lot of ways, the more, one of the things that I'm working on with writing and book ideas and just sorting through history, it's going to take years, but is is it invention or is it evolution this is a thought i've really been thinking on because mm -hmm. something's invented but then it evolves but some things are just invent invented perfectly like the yeah. telecaster like yeah you're not gonna i have literally seen the telecaster on stage with brad paisley under oath metallica <laughs> like you know like yeah buddy holly Joe, buddy holly <laughs> Yeah, that's a perfect guitar. It's preference, but but can you really evolve a Telecaster? I don't think so. So why do we we want the Telecaster? That's just an example. Can you yeah. really of can you really evolve a tone bender? Right. I mean, that's you want the tone bender because you heard Led Zeppelin one or whatever. Yeah. So you're going no, I don't want to evolve it. It's like it's invented. Yeah. That's just done. an interest. Yeah we're getting into like philosophy here, but that's like an interesting psychological process with a lot yeah. of this stuff. Totally. Cause another person could say anything can be improved, you know, e even incremental, but that's the question. Like, I don't know if that's the case. Yeah. That's really something that so, and guitars and gear are just a great example of this, of what you're of this point. Yeah. Yeah. Like, do we need a better mousetrap? I, I don't, I, I, I revert the older. So I'm, I'm 38, about to be 39. I just keep going backwards. Like I, like I've just like avoided, I'm like back to spring reverb tanks, like on top of my amp. I'm like, I'm just de evolved. I'm like, you know, <laughs> yeah. there was a time when I'd be like the newest brand newest thing. And now yeah. I'm like, I don't know. Just give me like the, <laughs> cause I'm, it all sounds the same when I play it anyway. Cause I'm me. Yeah, there's yeah. like there's a thing about just so many things when they were created were perfect or almost perfect. That first pedal, the Maestro Fuzz Tone 62, it it wasn't great, but the Tone Bender three years later is great. So huh. invention, evolution, and then everything yeah. after the Tone Bender, like the Fuzz Face, it's great. It's basically a Tone Bender. Like it kind of yeah. just. You know, 69, yeah. we have the big muff. That's different. That's an actual new thing. But pa even I would even go as far as to say, like, there's really not a new, there's not a new dirt pedal, fuzz, overdrive, distortion, 
past, like, honestly, like 1978. That's amazing. Te- technically. I mean, you right. could split hairs and I could prove myself wrong, but. Sure. So do these old electronics, is there something about the electronics themselves that's in some way different than the pedals you're making right now that, that a person could say, well, they're superior because of this part or something, or is it, is it the rest of technology has only gotten better. So the, the, the most obvious way to think about it would be, well, the newer, I don't know, transistors are better for this reason, but how, yeah. how do you think about that? So I have a friend, I have a few friends who are chefs. Like I have a friend named Sean Brock. He's a really famous chef in Nashville. He has restaurants all over. All right. The dude, the dude, you can give him, I feel like I could give him like ingredients from the dollar store and he'd like blow (laughs) my mind. You can give me the greatest ingredients ever. You can give me like million dollar truffle oil and like whatever. I can't cook. So the parts do not matter if the creation isn't good. That's something guitar players just totally miss. It's just like, boom, just like over their head. Now, are old parts amazing? Yes. There, uh, somebody sent me a box today. Of, like I was opening it here, sitting with Addison. We're like, oh my gosh, these are like original old parts. They're so cool to see. And I love yeah. building with them. But technology has gotten better and better and better. Transistors are better and better and better. They're more predictable. Yeah. It's, there is this, there is a sonic nostalgia that, yeah, germanium transistors sound like a tone bender or a fuzz. There is a sound. Can we do it another way now? Absolutely. I've done it like with the legends of fuzz series and stuff, a line of pedals I have that pays tribute. I build them Mm -hmm. in a modern way, but I make the sound of the old circuit. Mm -hmm. So we really want, I think at the end of the day, there's the two things to land the plane is like the ingredients are only as good as the cook the design. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just like, we really want to believe there's magic in parts or like there's unattainable things somewhere. And I think Mm -hmm. with guitar players that turns into this pedal. That's like, you can't find it anywhere. It's got to be the one or it has these parts in it. There's none of these left. This is the magic. I'm going to plug into (laughs) this. And I'm yeah. going to become Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's not to say like, that's inspiring. Like to get a piece of gear that a hero played and to like hold history. I mean, this room's full of it. I get it. But that doesn't, it's all subjective. And a yeah. lot of playing, a lot of any collecting or hobby, but especially guitar, playing through that real amp that's that old and that guitar if it makes you play better and f- it, there is a thing, yeah. there's a thing it, it reciprocates like that's real. But back yeah. to, to answer your question specifically, you can make any sound that has ever been made with newer parts. It's just like, do we want to believe it? That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So you have better perspective on this than I do, but to me, it seems like there's not as much interest among kids in electric guitar these days. When I, I was, I, I think we're the same age and in the nineties, it was like everything. If you're really not everything, but if you were really good at guitar and could play, you know, the solo to cherub rock, you were <laughs> the coolest guy in school. And mm-hmm. I don't really see that. I, now I know I'm not on high school campuses or around kids much, but w- what's going on these days with cu- <coughs> culture of guitars and, and rock? Yeah, I I relate. I remember, I remember learning like Santa Monica by Everclear, or like you know some, just like a like Cake, the Distance yeah, riff or exactly. something, and just being like, I am a god. <laughs> exactly. You know, it just felt it just felt. You go to school and you're like, I can play that, and you can't. You get with your friends. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I I don't know. Yeah, I think I think we both struggle because it's like the world's so different. Like. Yeah, there weren't phones. There weren't like even video games. I remember like I had a Super Nintendo. You know, like how long is that? I can only play NBA Jam like a hundred times. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think there's an attention span problem or a situation. I don't know if it's a problem, mm-hmm. but it's like there's so many other things. I I think for our generation, 
it was very much like I grew up really rural, but like I think the general view would be like you know you get into rock music, you learn to skateboard or something. You like there aren't a ton of things to do. Yeah. Um, now there's so much to do. I will say, yeah. last year was 2020 was record guitar sales, and that mm. feels I feel hopeful that there will be a younger crowd. Like the demographic yeah. thing is concerning. Like especially as our YouTube channel has grown and, you know, exploded more and more. We see the demographic. It says, yeah. you know, it's basically like 40 or 30. What's the age? It's like, 24 to 35. yeah, 24 to 35. It's yep, getting it's older. Go. It's getting older and older, older. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I think back to me, you know, I'm like 16 printing tabs off a dot matrix <laughs> exactly. printer you know, <laughs> smuggling them home from the computer lab, sitting in my room. I don't know. Will that ever happen again? I see. I very rarely see people my age, how I viewed myself. And is yeah. I wonder too, yeah. bec- I, I think it could f- it flip a little bit because like my kids, for example, they, they know a lot about guitars and guitar pedals because they're in the living room all the time. Not a ton, but you know, three or four. And when I was a kid, I didn't, I didn't had no idea what any of these things were. And even when I was in high school, I knew what they were, but nobody could afford them. You know, everybody's too right. poor when you're a kid. But anyway, so like, like my kids are gonna, I don't, we'll see what they're like when they're teenagers. But they're gonna have a lot more awareness and access. And just the fact that you're injecting so many hundreds of thousands of pedals into the world, you know, I'm sure back in the day, a tone bender was like solid gold if you could get your hands on one right. to some extent. Whereas now. If you want to create this kind of tone, there's a lot of ways you can get there. And there's a good chance at there's something at the pawn shop that'll get you closer to Craigslist. And so I, I don't know, maybe um who knows? Maybe there's maybe we are due for a big resurgence after uh you know, my kids get older in years. So Yeah, I um, I think it is a it's a circle and there are things happening again. And I I I think it's even musically, I just keep waiting for like grunge again. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I do. Yeah. I think there's something to like, we're, we're a long way. Like you and I have gotten old, you know, it's like, that was a long time ago. Like Nevermind yeah. came out like a long time ago. I was letting yeah. my daughter hear Nevermind and it hit me. She's 13. I was like, what do you think of this? And she's like, you know, she's like amusing me. Yeah. <laughs> and I realized yeah. I realized this is what it felt like when my mom showed me Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. And I was like, that's crazy. like, I'm the distance wow. from nevermind that my parents were from Sergeant Pepper. That is, that Bonkers. is really wild. My goodness. But yeah, we that's love, really something. Yeah, it is. Wow. It is. Yeah. You, you don't realize it seems like yesterday. I remember hearing that the first time and just being like, Oh my gosh, this is, that's how your so, parents felt when they're yeah. talking about whatever, you know, mm-hmm. it's wild. Yeah. It's funny about grunge because I, that, if that was a response to like the really, you know, the sound of the eighties and seventies kind of big hair rock really produced or however you want to describe it. Yeah. With the way music is produced and made now, there's definitely an opening for somebody to be like enough of this, like perfectly metronome kind of style. Yeah. Let's just, let's let's shake this up big time so yeah maybe there will be a a, a 2.0 like so, a revolt yeah 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 exactly a, a a revolt or just a yeah the same a similar energy um okay so let's talk about jhs for a minute and yeah. my first question it's got to it seems like a dream you know working in something a passion you love but at the same time work is work so how do you how do you explain this to somebody who just thinks you have the world's best job and you do and i'm sure you would agree but at the same time you have a, a pretty pretty huge business and a lot of people and a lot of uh vendors and what's that like working in in an industry that you have such passion and love for yeah i yeah i'll i'll second what you said you spoke pretty pretty right on track like i am all i'm amazed that i do this for a living like you know it doesn't it doesn't bypass me i'm just always amazed super thankful grateful for fans and people that love our products and that we get, you know, for me getting to employ this many people is like 
the dream. You know, I, I love, I love the business because it's like, it's helping our community. It's helping people's lives. And that's just, and the bigger we get, the more we get to do that. So that's awesome. But yeah, it is, it is interesting. You know, I, I had no business background. My parents were both, uh, they dropped out of high school, really poor families and just had to work. So like, I didn't have the family where like you sit around and talk to your dad about his portfolio, you know, like that wasn't a thing or like, dad, (laughs) tell me how you do taxes. You know, just like (laughs) that was never a thing. So, you know, starting it, I mean, I'll say this, it was, constant miracles that the business did not like self-destruct like the briefcase in the James Bond movie or something. It was just like constantly just overcoming stupid things. I didn't know. I joked about taxes, but like that was a, you know, Oh, I got to pay tax. You know, there's just like getting it on the ground and right place at the right time, right people would just always come along. And, and I had this amazing group of people that joined me over four to five years and just like, just owned it with me. Like such amazing people like Steve, my general manager, like came, took a chance. I remember me saying, Hey man, I really need some help. Like, I think I can pay you, you know, and he's Mm -hmm. been with me for like a long time now over a decade. So it's not, you know, people look at JHS. Um, JHS is a lot of people. I only do two to three things well. And I love those things. So it's design circuits, marketing and teaching. And I love mm-hmm. running the business, you know, being to, here in a place to help people and employ people. But really everything else is everyone else. And mm-hmm. and I think that's important to know. And it, it is hard to, I think people have some preconception about, you know, the life as a pedal maker or something. It's kind of funny. Yeah. You know, some of the comments I'll, you get on a forum and it's like, he's charging $200 for a pedal. I can build for $9. <laughs> he's probably got a yacht. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, you don't understand basic economy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I love, I love the job. It's evolved now to where I work more on the history side of things, the show and all the stuff I'm doing with collecting history than I do the pedal company. Uh, they're pretty yeah. even, but I think I, I tip the scales a little more with the show now. And that's wild. If you told me that three years ago, I'd been like, what? Like, how does that yeah. work? Uh, it's just, yeah. it's because there's a team mm-hmm. and yeah, it's amazing. It's, I'm super grateful for it. And it's bizarre. I, I still weekly, at least just have that moment where I'm like, this is crazy. Like <laughs> so fun. I just really thankful. So, Maybe our last thing, and on a kind of a technical standpoint, because I'm certainly a guy who loves to do anything with my hands. It's just part of, it's just so satisfying and whatever the, even like home repair and auto repair, I'll, I'll, I love doing it. And it sounds great to make your own pedal and kind of just, just, just for the experience of it. Is that something people can do? And if someone wanted to do that, you know, in their garage and, and make their own pedal, um, how, how would they do, how would they try something like that? Yeah. Guitar pedals are a magically wonderful entry into electronics. So uh, guitar pedals are defined as small signal electronics. And small signal electronics is, you know, transistor radios, uh, little DIY circuits like you'd see in popular mechanics and things since the 50s. Um, A flashlight is a circuit. You don't realize mm-hmm. it. There's a light bulb and power and a, you know, so it, it yeah. falls into that and it can be more complicated or whatever. But, but a person like, you know, someone watching this, you could build a boost pedal. You could build a fuzz pedal. You could definitely build it. And the easiest way to start is with a, a pre-made kit. There, there are several places online that do a good job at this. They'll, you can go to a website and, um, I'll give you some links that you can maybe okay. put so people can can check that out. Um, there's several places that are really good. General Guitar Gadgets is one. Uh, 1776 Effects, Build Your Own Clone. But basically, you could go and click, I want to build a boost pedal. And you click boost, and they'll send you the enclosure, the knobs, all the parts, solder, these really nice printed off instruction sheets. 
Oh, but yeah, cool. you, you, anybody could sit okay, and build and make that. It easy. Stu Mac, uh, which you may know from, they build guitars and have guitar parts. If you're not familiar, yeah. Stuart McDonald, I think the website Stu Mac, they have excellent kits. You can even build, they have guitar kits, pedal kits. Wow. So it's a really awesome way to get into that. I've had teachers approach me, show me their classes where they do, you know, this one guy took his woodworking class, built some guitars, and then he took a semester and they built pedals. And like, <laughs> it's a wonderful, because cool. a kid can do it. You know, it's not, yeah. it's not rocket science. If it was, I would have never figured it out. <laughs> um, but it, it's really fun. It's a massive rabbit hole and it can yeah. be as complicated as you want it to be. Like you yeah. can get into some stuff that makes your brain melt, you know, but if you wow, just want to like build it for basics, you know, just yeah. learning like how soldering works and how circuits Perfect. work and what a, what a capacitor does that probably is yeah. about as good of a little lab as you can. Yeah. There are fuzz pedals that sound like you're going to plug, you'll build it and plug into it and you're just going to feel like Thor or something. And you can, <laughs> you know, it's like six parts. <laughs> Because you're just overloading a transistor, but it just yeah. you just feel so powerful. You're like, I did this, yeah. So uh, yeah, that that's worth doing for sure. Well, can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day. We'll put links to your channel, uh, the JHS show, and your websites, and anything else you'd like to put in there. And I feel like you're. I feel like this service of consolidating and codifying this history is so valuable, and it's probably not the most glamorous thing you could be doing but i just love it and i can't wait for the book someday so um i appreciate that yeah and and uh thanks again for taking the time and is there anything else to to sum this up for for someone who made it to the end who didn't know about pedals uh, to start with uh i've tried i mean the channel is if you go to youtube and click in the search bar the jhs show we're you know over we're almost to somewhere like 150 episodes of like you could just waste away a day binging on <laughs> guitar history and stuff so and there's probably a playlist in there on our channel called history and stuff yeah if yeah. you if you found any of my rambling interesting you can go overload and overdose on it on the channel and there's some other really good things if you start watching our videos youtube will psychically introduce some new things to you as well i'm sure <laughs> So yeah. yeah, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful point of history that is missed. We talk a lot about artists changed all this stuff, but they had to have sounds. Yeah, and I think uh, inventors are usually looked over and not thought about as much as the musicians or artists we love because there's no, there's no chorus to get stuck in your head. You know, you know, you'd, yeah. it's a different dynamic. But yeah if you thought this was cool then there's definitely a channel full of stuff and there's so much more stuff online if you start digging that's beautiful all right thanks josh we'll have a great day and we'll catch you next time all right